I've always known there was a dark side to the ocean. I just never knew, and never expected, in a million years, that I would have to see it. Overfishing was something that happened far out to sea, in only the dark corners of the earth, and my country was safe from such things. I was wrong. I was here the split moment that the amount of sharks I've seen dead began to outweigh the amount I've seen alive. You can read statistics, see the end of the ocean in the form of numbers. They show you how shark fishing has boomed in the last decade, and how the collapse has already begun. But you can't imagine how truly terrible it is without seeing it, without smelling it, without stepping in it. They are all here for this. Indonesia was never known for catching sharks, and fishermen did not target them. Yet the boom in China's middle class and the popularity of shark fin soup and demand for fins began to creep its way into other countries. By the beginning of the 21st century, Indonesia was the world's leading shark fin producer. In the mid-1950s, shark catches began to increase around the world. In the 70s, it was 500,000 tonnes. Then in the year 2000, this increased to 858,000 tonnes. The majority of sharks and rays captured in Indonesian fisheries are bycatch from tuna fisheries. Except in this town. Here they are major target species. We are already starting to see evidence of overfishing occurring, with these men taking their boats out for weeks at a time now to catch less than they did before, and barely making enough money to stay above the poverty line. They are increasingly venturing into Australia's waters, just to catch sharks. It was crazy, it went a lot smoother than I thought. Last time I was there, we got a lot of suspicion from this one guy, and I found out that he is the buyer for the Chinese. So he goes in there and sees the sharks and pretty much tells the fishermen how much they're gonna pay for them and gets them all ready for the Chinese. He looks different, he acts different, and he was suspicious of anyone filming. These guys, they know that they've been exposed in the past and they don't want anyone coming in and doing it again. Indonesia has jurisdiction over an exclusive economic zone of about 3.1 million square kilometres, the fifth largest in the world, meaning a vast amount of ocean they own and fish to their desire. There are few laws here, and much corruption. No unit of protection given by any of the organisations around the world is enough to stop the fishing of vulnerable species, and you'll often find protected animals here, juveniles, manta rays, So I got to film some stuff without them being suspicious, which was really neat. That wasn't even the worst I've seen that market, which is the messed up thing. I've seen it far worse in the past. There would have been about 40 plus sharks today and a bunch of manta rays. They are too deep now to stop. If stricter fishing laws were in place and their catch decreased even a small amount, many would suffer especially the women of the community, employed in the processing side of shark exports. Any restrictions on fisheries output will create ripple effects through the entire economy. It is hard to see a future for these oceans, or these people, after stepping in the blood of breeding adult sharks, and virtually no regulations. It gives rise to new despair for the state of the planet. 
It is clear now it won't be a sanctuary that saves sharks, or a marine park laid down by governments. No protected species classifications can help animals here. But maybe individuals can. This is my friend Paul Fries. He is from Hawaii, but for the last five years has been living in Bali. Paul initially dreamt of setting up a tourism operation here with cage diving and sharks, and was almost successful, until the sharks were wiped out by local fishermen. This inspired him to create these nurseries instead, and now Paul has a floating sea pen in Sarangan Harbour, and it's home to several baby sharks. Paul rescues, rehabilitates, and releases sharks. Sharks are kept alive in tanks at restaurants here, and sometimes cooked whole. Paul buys them from the restaurants alive, and takes them back to the pens. He has also changed the minds of a few fishermen and buyers at the local market who no longer catch and kill sharks, but keep them alive after accidentally catching them and bring them to Paul to release. This also gives Paul the unique opportunity to get people in the water with sharks. People of all ages come here to swim with these sharks. Once the sharks are grown and fit, they face a different fate. Paul releases them. With 181 rescues under his belt, Paul continues to facilitate the survival of sharks, even successfully infiltrating a high-class bar that had baby sharks in tanks on display. Paul worked on building a relationship with the managers here. They reached out to Paul for advice on feeding them and caring for them, and he slowly convinced them to let him take the sharks out of their tanks and release them. He's now working on alternative displays with them. We've saved 181 sharks and it started with a litter of 10 baby black tips being stuck at a low tide seaweed farmer. Um, he was going to, you know, butcher them and sell them to the fish market. Uh, instead, we, we intervened, we got them, kind of intercepted them. I found out the pricing was about 15 bucks per shark and that's a half meter based on its weight. That's what he's going to make, which is really nothing. Um, so that's why we're able to start it. But if they can get 15 bucks for a shark, it's still worth value to them. But now, well, hey, I can get 15 bucks, but now I can keep it alive. The reason we're keeping it alive, they'll put it back into my reef. There'll be more sharks, I mean, more fish later to, to be caught. The reefs will be healthier, clean. So a lot of them, it resonates and they get it. Um, and the other thing I've seen, fishermen show up with their kids to the nursery and they'll like play with the sharks. They'll feed them and show their kids. So that that's a really, maybe it shows pride that they didn't have to kill something every time they go out fishing. So the sun is down. We got a call. Hugh Basar, 1.6 meter shark. Sinaraja? Oh. 
female. Be female. You uh, look, yeah. Be. But my favourite story of Paul's, and perhaps proof of his influence in the local community, comes from North Bali. Fishermen filled the back of their car with water and drove four hours to Paul to give him a shark. The shark was pregnant and the fishermen couldn't kill it. Paul is literally raising a next generation of sharks only a few islands away from the mass slaughter. It is easy for us to sit here and blame them, hate them, call this a disgusting practice. But the reality is, this is our fault. These sharks are not feeding the locals. They have no desire to catch sharks, only a desire to make money. Each one of these fins goes to China. These individuals are being fished by men who know no better and are trying to feed their families. The Chinese buyers, the Australian supermarkets selling shark meat from Indonesia, the shark tooth necklaces for sale, and the people who buy it. This is the real evil that we need to focus on. While I was here, I discovered there was more than one fishing village on this island. The other fishing village is known as Garupok, but Garupok has taken a very different path to its shark fishing neighbours. Garupok is known for only one thing, surfing. And every single fishing boat in this village now serves the purpose of taking surfers to the waves. Surfing has saved the sharks here. People come from all over the world to surf Garupok, and the locals make good money from surf lessons, boat rides, and board hire. They transform their boats once dedicated to fishing to be able to carry us to the waves. Their income is higher than that of the men fishing sharks. And the waves will never disappear from the oceans like the sharks will. Perhaps there is no future in Indonesia's fishing. Perhaps surfing or swimming with sharks will take precedence over killing. The only thing we can be sure of is that the fishing occurring now will not last. And when the shark populations crash, the oceans will crash with them. And if we don't stop now, it will be too late.